isn't going to tell us the facts. Um, most politicians won't either. If we're going to learn the facts, we're going to have to learn them here. And so we've been covering this series. Um, we emphasized last time that we're going to probably resolve most of the issue if we can establish the fact that life begins at conception. I mean, if you're a person from, from that moment on, um, it, it's, uh, it's murder to kill them. So, um, and I closed last time talking about um, having learned um, that we were going to have our first Jessica. She was born tiny, and she pretty much stayed that way. She weighs less than 100 pounds today. And she's, um, what, uh, 45? Yeah, I'm not old enough to have a 45-year-old child, am I? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you, Mike. You helped me out there. I am, but my wife's not. Okay. Um, we knew that there was life there and that God had blessed us. The Bible says in Psalm 127, 3, and it's on your little sheet, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And for anybody who doesn't have those little sheets, we've got some extra copies if you'd like one. It's just a handful of verses that are really pertinent to the issue of divorce. Um, the passage in uh, Psalm 127 continues in verses 4 and 5 saying, As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gates. We recognized that conception was a gift from God. Dr. Sexton, again, who, whose book I, I derived a lot of my material from, um, quoted from a book entitled, Before It's Too Late, without giving the author's name. And since there are several books by that name, I couldn't determine who the author was without reading at least the better part of most or all of them. And I didn't have time to do that. But the extraction he used said, the Supreme Court has ruled that abortion, even abortion on demand, is an American freedom. But we don't call it abortion anymore. We call it post-contraceptive fertility control. Feminists call it voluntary miscarriage and every woman's right. You know, I, how is murdering babies feminine? I, I, I like the word feminine. I can apply it to my wife. That's what I like about her. They're not feminists. They're not, that's, that's, a, that's a deceptive title. The Supreme Court, mm, here I go again. The Supreme Court of the United States has made it a law that anywhere in this country, for any reason or for no reason at all, one can take the life of the preborn and little progress has been made to reverse that decision. Since life is a gift from God, think about how people are accountable to God for those decisions. They're, they are accountable to God for the millions of innocent babies who have been killed. The blood of these babies stains the hands of parents who choose abortion and people who perform abortions in this country. I um, have already given my take on that, and I actually hold the abortionist himself or herself if, uh, as, you know, the Bible does speak of degrees of sin. Now, the slightest sin um, 
is a defect or is, is evidence of a defect uh, for which anyone's condemned to hell. But in life, there are degrees of sin. The Bible does teach that. And if so, and because so, I hold the, the abortionist himself even more accountable. He takes advantage of a situation for one reason only, money, money. I, I believe Planned Parenthood has, has um, promoted and established almost pornographic um, sex education in the public schools with the hope, now they say it's to reduce unwanted, pregnancy, unwanted pregnancies, but I believe that they have established that in the schools to get babies on the way so they have more business. I, Planned Parenthood is straight out of hell. We need, we need to stand where God stands on this issue. On this issue, as on every issue, we need to stand where God stands. This is an issue that there is no middle ground, for which there is no middle ground. And God's word deals clearly with this subject. Preachers are charged with preaching all the counsel of God, Acts 20:27. 20, that command would be pretty much pointless if he didn't want us to know what God's word says. If a man will not preach what the Bible says, fearing God and not fearing people, he should not be in the ministry. The Bible clearly teaches that the unborn child is a human being. We must do what we can to protect the lives of these unborn children. Consider, I believe this is on your, your, your sheet of verses, um, Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12. This one is, has a different ring to it than the others. It says... If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it, and he that keepeth thy soul doth not he know it, and shall not he render to every man according to his works? We, we can't claim ignorance. Um... We just can't. Now, I've got something here that I've added that's my own. I'm going to confess there's something. Yes, sir? That's a good point. That's a good point. I have this next brief section in a different color to to um, remind me to say that this is not from, at all from the book. N nobody speaks to this because I think they, like me, don't know exactly what to do with it. I'm going to confess, if you don't know exactly what to do with it, you're not alone. Don't tune me out and do not get ahead of me here. Listen to what I'm saying, but don't. Um, don't try to fill in where I'm not saying. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Just think about it. If one adult used lethal force to stop a second adult from willfully killing a young child, say a four or five-year-old, that adult who so intervened would probably wind up being considered a hero. That is very likely at least part of the type of thinking of individuals who kill abortionists, protecting children. I am not promoting their acts, so don't go out of here and say, Faith Baptist Church, or more specifically, Brother Donnell said, go kill abortionists. I'm not but I can understand their thinking a little bit. 
In fact, at least for certain reasons, I oppose that. But quite honestly, I cannot figure out a delineating principle of right and wrong by which to distinguish between saving the life of an unborn child and that of a four-year-old in this way. Current laws of the land make a distinction, but it has been a long time since we could confidently rely on our laws as a standard for right and wrong. That's why Acts chapter 5 says we ought to obey God rather than man. There's going to be conflicts. Consider, however, that a major inevitable outcome of violent approaches to the abortion issue is the galvanizing of the pro-abortion crowd against the pro-life position and everyone and everything associated with it. That includes those of us who know the truth of the gospel, would share it with them, and would thus perhaps win them to Christ, potentially transforming them to a biblically informed pro-life position. Some of today's leading opponents of abortion were once actively involved in the abortion industry. Additionally, the ungodly liberal media would jump for the chance to twist and use such an occurrence to further discredit the pro-life movement and every other issue that pro-lifers stand for. I don't have an answer there. So don't ask me for an answer. But I'm, I'm not promoting killing abortionists. I just have a little sympathy, that's all. Millions say it's a matter of choice. Well, whose choice is it? It is impossible to ask the babies whether or not they want to be aborted. We have not pleaded the cause of the unborn as we should have pleaded it. We have not sufficiently provided Christian alternatives for broken-hearted parents and daughters as we should have. Now, Dr. Sexton has these thoughts as possible helps in this area. He says that there should be homes in our churches that are open for expectant girls to live in in order to provide natural birth for their children. He says, further, we should be more earnestly engaged in good Christian ministries that are fighting this awful sin and trying to provide the right alternatives for young people. I praise the Lord we do uh, support um, the um, Life Options. I still think of their old, I don't know why, Life Options Clinic. And my wife and I um, send them a little check each year in addition to what our church does. We, we want to be a part of that. Not just the church, but we personally want to be a part of that. Um, of course, as we have already indicated, the greatest work we do is the work of winning souls to Christ and teaching them from God's word how to live the Christian life. The person who believes the Lord Jesus Christ follows him and is informed on this subject, will not likely choose to have an abortion. Dr. Sexton says that when he started researching this matter, he almost became physically ill over the means that are used to abort children. He cites Gary Burgle, and his pamphlet, Abortion in America, as his source of information on some of the most common methods of abortion being practiced in this country. Christians need to be fully informed so as to be confident in standing in opposition to this practice. Also, we need to recognize the utter depravity. Now, this may... There are some who might be angry at the, at the tone 
and the assertion of this statement. I'm sorry for you if it does. The utter depravity of the political party that makes, quote, abortion rights a major plank in their platform. And it's the Democratic Party. The, the Republican Party's got problems all through it. I know it does. But they don't stand on the right to murder babies. And that's a pretty big distinction. I am at this point going to go through some facts regarding abortion methods about which Christians need to be informed. We won't hear this information on the liberal anti-God left-wing media. The only way we're going to be taught, learn of some of these types of information is in church. Pastor has trusted me to use good judgment as to the appropriateness of what I present. This material were perhaps, uh, bring tears. Feelings of genuine illness as Dr. Sexton experienced, and perhaps even anger. I hope the anger is not directed at me, but rather at our nation's cooperation with Satan, the author of this horror. We must not allow our personal comfort to be the standard for evaluating such material. For all our sakes, I believe we need to hear it. The first one is called the suction method. This type of abortion is the most commonly used method for early pregnancies. By the way, this gets very dark. But if you'll stay with me through it, whether we finish this part today or, or carry over into next week, I promise you that we're going to turn the corner and it will get brighter again, okay? In this technique, which was pioneered in communist China, a powerful suction tube is inserted through the cervix into the womb the body of the developing baby and the placenta are torn to pieces and sucked into a jar. This is as violent as it sounds. I've been informed of a book and a movie. I believe it's called Unplanned and a um, I guess you'd call it a, a, an administrator at an abortion clinic who just handled the paperwork and promotion, didn't have any hands-on to do with it, was called in to assist in an abortion on one occasion. Um, I'm not sure why, but they were shorthanded, and, uh, and she was on hand, and the abortionist uses an ultrasound machine to guide what they do. And what she saw uh, on the ultrasound changed her life forever. She is now a leading pro-lifer. I, I saw um, this movie, I'm told, is not, you, can, you can buy a DVD of it, but it's not the kind of movie you pop popcorn and go in and watch. It's a, it, it shows a segment of an ultrasound recording of an abortion. I saw a, a movie segment one time, just a clip. It was called The Silent Scream. And it was the baby trying to protect itself from the threat it sensed 
of the encroaching abortionist. The curette method, another type of abortion is curette abortion. This method is most often used in the first 13 weeks of pregnancy. A tiny hoe-like instrument called the curette is inserted into the womb through the dilated cervix, its natural gateway. The abortionist then scrapes the wall of the uterus, cutting the baby's body into pieces. This method is now used less frequently than suction. Using this particular method, at times the abortionist the abortionist is not able to get the head out, and he has to take his own hand and crush the little baby's skull into small pieces in order to remove it. This material was presented in, in Temple Baptist Church, a huge church in Powell, Tennessee, where Dr. Sexton is pastor. He wanted his, his people to know, we need to know the salt poisoning method. The next method is salt poisoning. This method is generally used after 13 weeks of pregnancy. A long needle is inserted through the woman's abdomen and a strong salt solution is injected directly into the woman's amniotic fluid that surrounds the child. The salt is swallowed and breathed and slowly poisons the baby, burning his or her skin as well. The mother goes into labor about a day later and expels the dead, grotesque, shriveled baby. Some babies have survived this salting out and have been born alive. There is also a cesarean section abortion. This method is used in the last trimester of pregnancy. The womb is entered by surgery through the wall of the abdomen. The tiny baby is removed and allowed to die by neglect or is sometimes killed by a direct act. Many times in this particular type of abortion, the baby lies on the table, moves about and cries for someone to help him until he dies. The chemical abortion method, we're told that this is one of the newer forms of abortion. Doctors use chemicals developed into a hormone-like compound which is injected or otherwise applied to the muscle of the uterus, causing it to contract intensely, thereby pushing out the developing baby. Babies have been decapitated during this abnormal contraction Many have been born alive. The side effects to the mother are numerous because of this contorting of her body and the trauma from this type of abortion. A number of mothers have died from cardiac arrest from the compounds that were injected. And this next one is the one that's been in the news the most, like It's called partial birth abortion. By now, most everyone is familiar with the horrors of the partial birth abortion method. According to an article published by the Concerned Women for America, which is a socially conservative evangelical nonprofit women's activist group, the abortionist uses forceps to deliver the entire baby except for the head. At this point, the abortionist uses blunt surgical scissors or a tracer to stab the baby at the base of the skull. He then inserts a vacuum tube into the skull and sucks the child's brains out. Then he can collapse the skull and pull the dead baby through the cervical opening. Of course, there is also the RU486 abortion, commonly known as the abortion pill. This method is also described by the Concerned Women for America. An RU486 abortion takes place in four visits to the doctor. During the first visit, the woman undergoes a pregnancy test, 
blood test, pelvic exam, and often an ultrasound exam. Though at an abortion clinic, the woman will never be shown the ultrasound image. Why? She might change her mind and they'd lose the business. RU486 RU is only effective during the first 49 days after conception. At the second visit, the woman takes three RU486 pills. This antiprogesterone prevents the endometrium, which is the lining of the uterus, from providing progesterone to the unborn child, which is necessary for its nourishment. Thus, the unborn child starves to death. At the third visit, the woman receives a drug that induces cramping in order to expel the dead child from her body. The fourth visit occurs about a week later to ensure the abortion is complete and to monitor the woman's bleeding. If the abortion is not successful, the woman undergoes a surgical abortion. The emergency contraception method, both oral contraceptives and intrauterine device may be used as so-called emergency contraceptives when they are used shortly after unprotected intercourse to abort a possible pregnancy. The same effect as using RU-486 RU can be caused by using legally prescribed oral contraceptives. Depending on the brand, two to five pills taken twice, 12 hours apart, can be used within 72 hours of unprotected sex to abort a possible pregnancy. The intrauterine device may also be implanted up to eight days after unprotected sex to abort a possible pregnancy. We do not need to wonder where God stands on this issue. I see tears and I understand them. I can hardly keep it. Oh, I haven't kept it. Think about your babies and your grandbabies. Think about how much you love them, how much you love to see them, hold them, kiss them. Think about their bright faces. Think about their laughter, their joy, and their smiles. What is taking place in this country should awaken us. One third of the children conceived in America will be killed while in their mother's womb. Most of us who have watched any news on this subject have heard or seen the story of the little baby whose arm was torn off in an attempted abortion procedure or some similar account. The baby lived to be born with one arm. Who will rise up and defend these innocent children? Their defenders must come from those whose hearts have been stirred by God and who are willing to let their voices be heard. A tidal wave of awful guilt is sweeping across this country. It is almost impossible to deal with this heavy load of guilt. We are a guilty land, a land full of guilty professionals. There is an awful load of guilt in mothers' hearts and in young girls' hearts. Some people are even losing their minds because of this guilt. As <laughs> we like to think we're at a crossroads. But Dr. Sexton says it differently, and I think he's right. As a nation, we are not at a crossroads. We are past the crossroads and near the end of the road. Abortion is only one sign of the moral ruin of our nation. If we are ever going to be praying Christians, we need to be so now. If we're ever going to be faithful Christians, we need to be so now. If we're ever going to be giving Christians, we need to be so now. When we complain about what we do not have, where we cannot go, and what we cannot enjoy, may we hear the cries of the millions of innocent children who have never had an opportunity to live outside the womb. 
We need to be somewhere on our faces praying for our nation. We need to be sure, without compromise, to stand where God stands on this. May God help us. Now, in my notes, that's a, a good place to, to stop. Our time is not totally used up today. That's the darkest point in our series. Come back next week, and I'll help you recover. There's some good stuff to come. Any, any comments? Mike? Is this on? Yeah. You know, we can't, uh, you can't, um, um, due, due to uh, uh, laws, you can't put to death. Confessed murderers cannot be put to death in many states in this country. And yet this is applauded. You know, the state of New York applauded the uh, partial birth abortion. All the politicians that approved it stood up and applauded it, and they changed the uh color of the uh, the uh, Empire State Building, one of those buildings. It's just, it's just, it's Romans 1 where the downfall of man's, you know, coming into place. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else have a final comment or thought?